All right, so this is, this is session two in the Eternal Blueprint review that we have been doing. And the title of this is The Sun is God's Ultimate Intention. And so what we've been doing is reviewing the Eternal Blueprint so we can get it deeper and deeper into our heart. So the, the first priority, and we talked about last time that there's five components of God's eternal purpose, but the first priority of God's eternal purpose is the supreme exaltation of his son. God's ultimate intention is for the son to have preeminence in everything and to be the center of all that he does. So the first component that we're going to look at of God's eternal purpose is the exaltation of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to talk about that today, but everything that we're going to talk about flows out of the eternal relationship that God the Father and God the Son had with each other before time and creation. Now, what I want to do, let's go ahead and turn our Bibles to Revelation chapter 21, is what I find is very helpful, is when I'm trying to understand things, is to begin with the end in mind. When you can see where everything is leading towards you can clearly understand that this is God's ultimate intention. This is where God is leading everything to. And so when we see that, understanding the beginning before time and creation makes so much more sense. And so let's turn to Revelation chapter 21, verse 22. God's plan is absolutely incredible. In the New Jerusalem, so Revelation chapter 21 and chapter 22 are focused on the New Jerusalem, which is the bride which comes down out of heaven. And John's writing about this, and he says, I saw no temple in it. In other words, what John is saying is, in the present heaven that exists right now, when we die and we go to heaven, there is a temple in the present heaven. And as we know from the tabernacle of Moses, which was built based on that temple, is that means there's a holy of holies, a holy place, and an outer court. But what God tells us here in the new city, Jerusalem, in the new, which is going to connect the new heaven and the new earth, God tells us that there's no temple in it. This is beautiful. The Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. And what this is telling us is that we are going not, we're, we're not going to dwell in a temple. We are going to dwell within God. Just like Jesus dwelt within the heart of the Father before time and creation. John 1.18, I believe, it says he was in the bosom of the Father. He was in the heart of the Father. He dwelt in the heart of the Father. Jesus Christ did. What God is unveiling to us is his bride is going to dwell within the temple who is God Almighty and the Lamb. We are going to dwell within God. Christ in us and God, us in God. It's absolutely beautiful. And it says, the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it. For the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. The Lamb of God for the eternal ages is the lamp that shines forth the glory of God forever and ever and ever. God's glory illuminates and fills the Lamb and the Lamb becomes the lamp that fills the new city Jerusalem to where there's no need for the sun or the moon or any of that to shine because God himself is the glory of that city. And us as the bride of Jesus Christ, us as the corporate son formed into the image of Jesus Christ are dwelling within God who is now the temple. Isn't that a beautiful thing? This is the end. This is where every single thing is moving towards forever and ever and ever eternal fellowship with God the Father and God the Son in the new city Jerusalem for the eternal ages. Now, let's look now at uh, Revelation, one chapter over in verse 3. 
talking about the new city Jerusalem, it says the throne of God will be in it. This, the new city Jerusalem is the holy of holies of the new heaven and the new earth. The throne of God will be in it. The lamb will be in it. And his bond servants will serve him. And I, I like to use the word minister to him. I think that's the better translation. The bond servants of God, those who followed the lamb wherever he went, the bride of Jesus Christ will minister to him as a priestly bride in the holy of holies forever and ever and ever. And see, sometimes we might go, oh, that sounds boring. No, if that sounds boring to you, you have no clue who God is. I mean, if Facebook and social media and video games and college football sounds more interesting than this, you have no idea of the glory and the beauty of the one. And then look at what it says. They will see his face. Think about that. For the eternal ages, God himself is going to unveil his face to his priestly bride in the holy of holies and in an eternal dining experience of communion with God in the holy of holies. And they will minister to him. His name will be on their foreheads. That means that he possesses them fully. In fact, you can go back into Exodus chapter 19 to talk about where God says you will, to the, to the Israelites, he said, you will be my possession. And I have called you to be a priest. The posse in other words, what, the, the being the possession of God and being his priest go hand in hand. What God is saying is there will be a people that God will have that will be his possession. They will have his name on their foreheads. They will be a holy of holy priesthood unto the Lamb of God forever and ever and ever, ministering to him and seeing his face. This is why we were created. That's the end. Now let's go to the beginning. Now let's go to the beginning when there was nothing, nothing. There was no one. This is before time and creation. This is before heaven was created. This is before the angels were created. This is before the throne was created, when it was just God and God alone. And if you were to look up and see, you know, it was impossible because no one was created, but if you were somehow to be able to see, all you would have seen is this unapproachable light, a light so bright, a light so intense Nothing and no one could penetrate into that light. But John tells us that light was not just some cosmic force. That light was not just some heavenly celestial being. That light was and is a person. God is light. And within this impenetrable light, within this light, dwelt the eternal Son of God. Before he was Joseph and Mary's baby boy, before he was Jesus of Nazareth, God, the eternal son, having no beginning himself, being the beginning, was dwelling within God the Father. John, I think it's John 1.18. He was in the bosom of the Father. He was, the bosom is the chest. He was in the heart of of the Father. So if you looked, all you saw was light. But within that light, the eternal Son was in the heart of the Father. And they shared an intimacy, and they shared a communion and a fellowship and a joy and a pleasure that we have no comprehension of whatsoever unending, joyful, ecstatic, delightful communion and worship. And I mean, I can't even imagine. I, I mean, I just, no one can imagine what they talked about. No one can imagine the joy, the ecstasy, the pleasure, the delight that was within the Godhead as the Father and the Son were connected to one another by the Spirit of God. But 
But what we see back before time and creation is what God is bringing us into and working us towards in the new city, Jerusalem. What we see in the new, in the new city, Jerusalem, where God and the Lamb are the temple, is basically he's bringing us into what the Trinity enjoyed forever before time and creation. What an incredible invitation. The very fellowship that God the Father and God the Son shared through the Holy Spirit for the eternal ages before creation, God himself created us so that we would be invited into that very fellowship. That is the new city, Jerusalem. That's what it's all about. That is God's ultimate intention. And the sun is at the very center of the entire plan. Incredible, incredible promise. See, if we want to understand God's eternal purpose and our purpose in, in him, then we've got to understand this, this relationship that, G, that and I'm, not even going to, I'm going to say the eternal son and the father shared in eternity past. Jesus said, I and the Father are one. Now that, that intimacy, that union did not take place only in the incarnation. That union, that intimacy was reaching back before the foundation of the world. Jesus and the Father shared an intimacy that human language cannot, cannot explain. Human language cannot articulate this deep intimacy and passion, this delight, this ecstasy, this joy, this incredible fascination as the father would behold his son in glory and in beauty and perfection. And he would likely say, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. As the father being the source of love would, sh would shower the son with love, the son would respond from the overflow of the father's love back to him. And they were one, and they have always been one. A partnership that we can't even fathom, that, you know, when Jesus walked the earth, he said, the Father loves the Son, and he shows him all things that he's doing. Whatever the Father does, the Son does in like manner. Jesus did not do one thing that his Father was not doing. The works Jesus did... We're out of fellowship. We're out of intimacy. And so everything he did was what the Father was already doing. That's how intimate, that's how unbreakable their union is. And God's raising up a people that are going to be just like that. Revelation 14, they follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Revelation 22, 5, the bond servants of God. The same, exact same thing. God is raising up a people, connecting them into his eternal purpose that will not do anything that God's not doing. They will not be, they will, they will long have sacrificed their religious traditions and their religious works and doing good things for God to now coming in this priestly role that we're going to minister to the Lord, we're going to fellowship with the Lord, we're going to have this deep intimacy with the Lord, and what we do out of that intimacy is the works we do, not for God, but with God, by his own power and strength. We never are ever disconnected. There was a partnership, and there is a partnership. There's a knowing that Jesus said that no one knows the Father except the Son. No one knows the Son except the Father and the one whom Jesus chooses to reveal to him. See, Jesus is the one that knew the Father, knows the Father deeply and intimately, and that stems back all the way into eternity past. And here we have as well this, this union, this intimacy, this bond that can't be separated in this intimacy 
the Lord reaches back in John 17, 24, and he said, when he's praying to the Father, you loved me before the foundation of the world. And herein lies God's ultimate intention. The catalyst, let me say it that way, of God's ultimate intention. The catalyst of God's ultimate intention is the passion that God the Father had for his beloved, eternal, uncreated son before time and creation. The burning passion of the Father for his son is the catalyst that created and caused God's eternal plan and purpose to come forth. That is it right there. God's passion for his son it's his passion for his son, his delight, his joy, his ecstasy, his pleasure that he has in his son. See, so many people would think, well, God, the father was just having, you know, compassion or he was loving one who was unworthy. Absolutely not. God the Father did not have to stoop down to love his son. God the son and God the father are equal. See, what was it? What, what is it about the Son that filled the Father with such joy, with such pleasure? It's the perfect balance of his infinite majesty and transcendent meekness. It's his radiant glory and servant-like humility. It's, it's his justice and unmerited grace, his uncompromising righteousness and his tender mercy his fear of God, and his equality with God. It's the son's submission to the father in his absolute dominion, his self-sufficiency and utter reliance upon him. See, when the father looked into the face of his beloved son, the father was filled with pleasure that we cannot even comprehend. I mean, we can't even fathom the delight the son provides and gave to the father. But it's flowing out of this jealous passion in eternity past that, that God said, I am going to create my ultimate intention, my eternal purpose, my plan and purpose that comes out of my love and passion for my eternal son. And so now we have what Paul calls the good pleasure of his will. Ephesians 1.5, Paul said that, that the eternal plan and purpose was established according to God's good pleasure. See, some people think God created all this and God did all this and they want to define what God's goodness is and they define God's goodness based upon how he deals with us. Have you ever noticed some of the language, God is good, God is good, God is good all the time? Well, it's usually related to this, God is good because he blesses me. God is good because he heals me. God is good because he prospers me. God is good because he gives me success and influence. God is good because he gives me the finances and he opens doors and all these things. God is good basically for what he does for me. Now, I am all in favor of all of that. I want God to bless me. Every one of us want God to bless us, don't we? I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. We shouldn't feel bad about that. But God is not good because he blesses us. God is good because he gives us himself. And if he didn't give us himself, he would not be good because he is the essence of goodness. That right there should, should shatter 95% or probably 99% of what is being taught in the, in the Christian world today. God is good because he blesses me. God is good because he provides for me. God is good because he heals me. No. God is good because he gives you himself and he invites you into the relationship of eternal intimacy and passion that the Father and the Son have shared before time and creation. That's why God is good. It's the good pleasure of God's will. God's eternal purpose is the good pleasure of God's will. It's for his good pleasure. Now we benefit certainly. 
we benefit, I mean, just the angels must look at us and go, you have no idea who you are. <laughs> you have no idea the one you're called to be married to. See, God is good because they wanted to share their eternally satisfying relationship with a creation. God is good because they weren't content to just be by themselves alone. They wanted to bring a creation into the fellowship that the Godhead had enjoyed forever before time and creation. See, the father wanted, as he gazed upon his son, the father said, I want to have millions and millions of sons that look just like Jesus Christ to me. I want to have millions of sons to bring many sons who have been conformed into the exact nature and image of this man, Jesus Christ. I want to bring them together as one corporate son that are just like my son to me. And that's the father's inheritance in the saints. And the son, looking at the son, the father said, you are going to have a beloved that comes forth from your very side and your beloved is going to be the one. You're going to be the source of love to this beloved. You're going to shower her with your love, the very love that I loved you. You're going to shower this beloved with your love, and they are going to receive your love. And out of the overflow of that love, they're going to love you back as one bride, married to you in intimacy and passion for the eternal ages. That's the son's inheritance and the saints. The Holy Spirit is going to have a people who are possessed by the very life of the Son of God. His very life possessing them to becoming a people for his own possession. So here's what we got to understand about God. God is supremely relational. Supremely relational. It's sad to me to see what the church of Jesus Christ and religion has done to God's eternal plan and purpose. It flows from beginning to end about relationship. Relationship with him, intimacy with him, fellowship with him. And then out of that, us having fellowship with each other and having fellowship with each other, we have fellowship with God together. This whole thing's about relationship. We've turned it into rules and morals and how to live right and how to do this and that. Um, there's, certainly some, there's certainly those things, but that's not what the heartbeat of God's eternal plan and purpose is about. God is supremely relational. Gosh, we've missed that. We get so caught up in revival and spiritual gifts and theological doctrines and religious rules, social justice, Cutting edge events, the latest and greatest technology, all the social media stuff, we, and we think that's what it is about. No, that's not what it's about. It is about relationship with him forever, to enjoy God forever. But here is a vital truth that we have to understand is the Father in their, their eternal plan and purpose and their heavenly counsel that we talked about last, last message. The Father said to the Son, only in you will my eternal plan be fulfilled. You are the way and the truth and the life. No man can ever come in to this fellowship of the Godhead but through the Son. You, son, are the, are the horizon of my eternal purpose. You are the boundaries of my eternal plan. You, son, are outside of you, there is no eternal plan and purpose. You are the very center. You are the son of which, uh, you are the son by which my plan orbits around. You are everything that this plan is about. Outside of Christ, there is nothing God is doing. Ultimately, I mean, there's other things, but God is leading us ultimately to Christ and him alone. Let's look at a couple scriptures here. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 11. 
Ephesians 3.11. Paul's talking about it and he says, This is in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord. Ephesians 1.9 said, The Father purposed to do everything in him. The Son of God is the boundaries of God's eternal purpose. The Son of God is the horizon of God's eternal purpose. Nothing is outside of those boundaries that's of the Lord. What the Lord is doing is in His Son, for His Son, and by His Son. It's all through Him, for Him, like Romans, Romans 11.36 talks about, it's from Him, through Him, and for His beloved Son. It's Christ, Christ, Christ. It's all, this is what it's all about. It's God's eternal plan and purpose was to establish the Son as the life, as the pattern and seed to which he would conform his people, to the bridegroom who would have a bride. It's all about Jesus Christ. Everything in God's plan and purpose is about him. But here is the crucial part we've got to understand. And Jesus revealed it in John 17, 26, when he prayed on his very last hour before his death, the very last moments of his life, he said, Father, I pray that the very love that you have for me, talking about the love from eternity past and the love he has now, would be in them. Here's what he said to conclude it. And he said, I in them. Have you ever thought about that? The love of God for you is he doesn't want to just be in a relationship with you. He wants to be inside of you. That's how much God loves you. In fact, there's no way we could ever become the bride of the Son of God apart from divine life. Because human life and divine life are completely incompatible. It's like mixing oil and water. They cannot be, they cannot coexist. So the only way we could ever become the bride of Jesus Christ, you know, part of his very being, bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh, so to speak, is for divine life to be implanted within us. And that's why the Father in the eternal counsel said to the Son, you as the life will be the life in my creation. You will be in them. Your life will be in them, and them having your life will now be able to be your bride for all eternity. It's the great mystery of God's eternal purpose. And Paul unveils this in Colossians 1, 25 through 27. He calls it the mystery. He said there's a mystery that you don't, really know about. There's a mystery that God has been working towards. There's a mystery that God wants to unveil. It is the mystery of Jesus Christ in you. Wow. John 17, 26. God's eternal plan and purpose revolves around Christ as your life implanted inside of you. The angels have to look at us and the way we live our lives <laughs> and think you have no clue who you are. The devils and the demons must look at us and go, we have done a great job deceiving you. You have the very seed of Christ in you if you're born again. The great eternal plan of God, Christ as life, coming to be planted within the heart of his people who would become, who would, who would have his life and then have his life in abundance. Christ, who is life. Christ, the tree of life. Christ, the one that we have inside of us. Christ, Christ, Christ. John 10.10, 10, Jesus said, I have come, this is, and you can see this, this is God's eternal plan and purpose working out into his earthly ministry. Jesus said in John 10, 10, I have come. He's telling us 
This is why I came. My coming is out of eternal plan and purpose. I have come that you would have life. He's not talking about your best life now. So unfortunately, it's so sad to see how people have distorted the message. But God, he's not talking about your best life now right here. He's talking about, I have come that the tree of life might be planted inside of you. And that you having the tree of life, you having my life, might then have my life in fullness, in abundance, flowing out of you like a mighty rushing river. See, you have been called to not just have the life of Jesus Christ implanted inside of you in seed form. You have been called to have the fullness of his Zoe life, his very nature, so filling every single part of your being, filling your heart, filling your soul, permeating all that you are until his life is flowing out of you like a mighty rushing river. What a plan God has for us. Here's where, when, when you think through this lens, see, most of the church is thinking through the lens of self-centered, a self-centered lens. What's in it for me? How does this benefit me? When you look at it through God's perspective, you realize how far the church has drifted, how far we have come, how far we have drifted. See, we, the church has become so preoccupied with the things of Christ, we've lost the person of Christ. And as I share in the eternal blueprint, I went through this myself for several years, getting enamored with spiritual gifts and getting focused on eschatology, the end times, and becoming enamored with Israel and, you know, whatever, spiritual warfare, praise and worship, all those different things of Christ. But what I've discovered is I don't need a thing, I need him. See, I've discovered is I don't need this or that. See, the, the church, by and large, is pursuing everything, all that they're pursuing, the things of Christ, rather than pursuing the person of Christ. There's a big difference here. They're pursuing revival. They're pursuing signs and wonders. They're pursuing, you know, miracles. They're pursuing blessings. They're pursuing all these different things of Jesus Christ. And what happens, and I know this from firsthand experience, what happens is when we start pursuing the gifts or revival or blessings or this or that, the things of Christ begin to eclipse the person of Christ. And we don't even realize it. See, we don't need revival. We need Jesus Christ, who is revival. See, we don't need signs and wonders and miracles. We need Christ who is signs, wonders, and miracles. See, God doesn't give us salvation. He gives us Christ who is salvation within us. God doesn't give us righteousness. He gives us Christ who is righteousness within us. God does not give us joy, peace, and you know, patience and love. God gives us Christ who is those things within us. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.30, he said, Christ became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification. See, we can get so preoccupied pursuing these things of Christ that we miss the person of Christ. It's Christ who is our righteousness. He doesn't just give us righteousness. He gives us Christ who becomes our righteousness. It's the person who dwells in us, he's giving us. He's given us Christ. And so you, you see that the, the, the church is so focused on the things of Christ rather than the person of Christ. And like I said, I share my testimony in a lot more detail in my book, The Eternal Blueprint. But God wants to bring the church back to Christ, where Christ is all and in all. And what I've found is that when Christ is at the center of my life and I'm pursuing a vibrant relationship with Jesus Christ, every other thing of Christ comes into balance. Spiritual gifts come into balance. Eschatology comes into balance. Israel comes into balance. Revival, signs, wonders, and miracles comes into balance. The blessings of God come into balance. 
When Christ is at the center, every single thing comes into balance. This helps me realize in terms of God's eternal purpose, maturity is not how much we know. Maturity is who we know. Maturity is not understanding theology or doctrine. I'm not saying we don't need to do that. I think we do. Maturity is not how high we jump in praise or how loud we shout during worship. Probably the other way around, but anyway. That's not maturity. Maturity is not how great our faith is. Maturity is not how much power we operate in. Maturity is not based on how much knowledge we have. Maturity is not based on how many great things we've done. Maturity is measured by the measure of Christ that is living in me. That is maturity. Maturity is based on how well I know him, not how much I know about him. That's maturity. So maturity is measured by the life of Jesus Christ that we have allowed to fill us and possess us and lead us and govern us. It's measured, that maturity is measured by how much we have come fully under the lordship of Jesus Christ. That is maturity. And so some people think, well, how do I get ready? How do I become an overcomer? How do I get ready for the eternal plan and purpose? And they want to go out and go do things for God. Again, there's, that doesn't mean we don't do things. It does. We do things. But maturity is not what we do for God. Maturity is measured of who we become to God. And out of our becoming to him by the Spirit of God possessing us, then we do based on the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So we think, okay, we need to go get ready. We need to get prepared. We're going to go out and do more. We're going to go pray more. We're going to go you know, fast more. We're going to go do things and you know, go do this and go do this for God. Now, if the Lord leads you to do that, by all means, do it. But the, the point of what, what God wants to say in terms of maturity, maturity is not measured by how much we do. It's measured by who we've become. Who we've become by the measure of the life of Jesus Christ, John 10.10, 10, the fullness of his life that we have allowed to possess us and to fill us. So that means God does not want to give us more things. God wants to give us more of his son. See, God doesn't want to give you more joy, peace, and patience. God wants to give you more of Christ, who is joy, peace, and patience. God doesn't want to give you more righteousness. God wants to give you more of Christ, who is righteousness. He is our sanctification. See, it's Christ that God wants to give us. As we bring this session to a close, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he said, talking about Peter, Peter had just gotten a revelation of Jesus Christ. Peter's eyes were open and he realized, you're not just any man. You are the eternal son of God. You are the Messiah. And the Lord said to him, Peter, upon this rock, I will build my church. He, you know, sorry to Catholicism, but Jesus was not saying to Peter, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build my church upon you, Peter. He was saying, I'm going to build my church upon the revelation of the Son of God. How we need a revelation of the Son of God. Not just to know him by our intellect, not to know him by our religion, not to know him by our doctrine, not to know him by our culture, not to know him by this or that, but to know him by the Spirit of God through revelation. That's how he builds his church. That's the only way he builds his church. He doesn't build his church by cutting-edge events or spiritual gifts. He builds his church upon Christ. He builds his church by the unfolding of Christ. He builds his church by the revealing of Christ. He builds his church by opening our eyes to see this is Jesus. And so the church has missed this. 
We think it's built on charisma, talent, spiritual gifts, leadership principles, church growth schemes, social media, creative eloquence, all these different things. And if that doesn't work, just put on some skinny jeans and a smoke machine and you'll definitely get God to come and build his church. <laughs> it's like, when are we going to learn that none of that does anything good for the Lord? God builds his church by revelation. Not by good preaching, not by good songs, not by any of the stuff we think he builds his church on. He builds the church of Jesus Christ on the revealing of his son. That's how he builds his church. And Paul said in Galatians 1, 15, he said, The father was pleased to reveal his son in me. See, the revelation Paul operated from, catch this, was not from only the revelation he had on the road to Damascus, which was external, the light of God shining in awe. That certainly was a huge thing in his life. Paul is saying there's something even greater than that. It's the internal revelation of Jesus Christ. See, you may not have a, an experience like Paul did where the light of God shines down like that, but you, we, every single one of us who have Christ living inside of us, every one of us can have an internal revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what Paul's saying in Galatians. He said, his son was revealed in me. See, so many people are wanting to get a revelation of Jesus going to this conference or that event or this revival meeting or this, listening to this guy on this podcast or whatever. How about we actually go to God himself in prayer and ask him for a revelation of his son? That doesn't mean we don't go to events. It doesn't mean we don't listen to people. We do all of those things as the Lord leads. But God wants to give us a revelation of his son. God wants to open our spiritual eyes so that we can see the beauty and the glory of Jesus Christ. He is not just this man from Nazareth. He is no longer a baby in a manger. He's no longer the broken man on the cross. When John beheld him in Revelation chapter 1, he saw the glory of the Son of God, the enthroned Son of God, the Lord of lords and King of kings who's coming back to this planet. We need a revelation of him. That's how he builds his church. That's how he fulfills God's eternal purpose. God's eternal plan and purpose revolves around his son. And in the unfolding revelation of his son, and, and all he gives to us in his son is how he builds his church. God's eternal plan and purpose, the first component of God's eternal plan and purpose is that the son of God would be at the center of everything he does. That Christ would have the preeminence once again in his house. Just like Paul was talking about in Colossians. In Colossians, Paul's talking about that he may have the preeminence in everything. Basically, the Colossians had gotten distracted by all of these things of Christ, wisdom and experiences and visitations and angels and all these different things of, of God. And Paul was saying, no, don't get distracted from the things of God. Come back to the person of Jesus Christ. Let him have the preeminence in everything back in his house. I think the revival people are praying for, the revival people are looking for, the revival that people have just been seeking and longing for is going to be much more of an exaltation of Jesus Christ back in his church again, back to the center, back to the center stage of the church than it is some other experience. I believe there will be all the other experiences, but Christ must come back to the center of his house. And out of that, he will bring the revival that we're looking for, we're praying for. It's Christ, it's him that God wants to place back at the center of his plan, at the center of his house. Amen.
So we'll end there. 45 minutes.